Well, good morning and welcome to Cana. I'm so grateful to see each of you. If you're our guest, special welcome to you. Thank you for being here. Um, we were wrestling through a little bit of uh, technical difficulty, but I think we got to the other side of that. But it is so good to see you. I hope that you have come ready for worship today. Listen, a few things that are going on. Um, definitely pay attention to Church Center. Uh, if you don't have Church Center, it's easy to get into Church Center. You just scan in uh, on your welcome card that you received when you came in. If you didn't get a welcome card, there are some out in the concourse, and so you can just scan in. Get connected to Church Center. It's got all of our announcements and the stuff that's going on around here, and there is a lot of stuff cranking up this week. So all of our Wednesday nights begin, our men's uh, midweek, and our women's study uh, kicks up, and Awana starts, and student ministry uh, kicks off. So you guys get connected. Um, be here on Wednesday night. Those are big nights for discipleship for us, and they can help you as you grow in your walk with Jesus. So I hope that you will be here for those things. I want to remind you, uh, if you are married, there is our marriage weekend coming up. And so, uh, so you can jump in on that. You can just scan this code, and it will get you connected to that. And so I hope that you will do this. We have had a great response in the past and every year we about double our uh, every year we about double our attendance and so I just want to encourage you if you're waiting 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 then you may wait yourself out of an opportunity so uh, go ahead and connect and get started you can you can get um, just get started with your uh, with your registration fee and um, and so join us for that okay I'm so grateful to be here with you this morning. I was uh, super charged up after last week, and it was just such a blessing to be able to worship with you. So I'm grateful to see you. I hope you came ready to hear from the Lord today. We continue in our Heritage series and just wanting to hear from God about, uh, especially this morning, about identity. I don't know if you know this, but there are plenty of idols out there that can take your attention away and can disrupt your walk with Jesus. And today we want to confront those and we want to move past those and we want to see where God is taking us, especially in regards to the creation of heritage in our families and um, through our parenting and grandparenting and all those phases of life. So will you stand with me as we invite God's presence because we need to hear from him. We need his grace this morning. Uh, we need his blessing of his presence. We come to sing to him. So as we, as we hear the music, as the guys on the platform begin to lead us in song, I want to encourage you, join in and sing. It is a righteous thing to sing to God. And so I hope that you'll do that this morning. All right, we take just a deep breath, loosen up a little bit. It's all right. We're here to hear from God. We're here that God would hear from us. And so I hope that you came ready for that focus and that worship. You look great, so you're ready, right? Let's pray. Let's invite the Lord's presence today. Oh, Lord, we ask for your blessings in this house. Lord, you can meet us anywhere at any time. Lord, you uh, sometimes confront us on that road of life. Lord, sometimes you confront us in this house. Lord, today we ask that you would be here among us, and Lord, that you would receive our praise and our thanks and our confession. And, Lord, that you would be pleased with that. Lord, that you would send us a blessing, that presence of your Spirit, that we might know that we've been with you. That is the great blessing of God, is your presence through your Spirit. Lord, some of us know exactly what's about to happen, and others of us have no clue. But, Lord, either way, we ask that our hearts would be transformed, that our minds would be conformed, uh, to your image. And Lord, in this moment, in this time, you would just prepare us, help us to set aside the hustle that it took to get here this morning, the frustration that we were experiencing because of uh, the fight we were just in, or that we might have a moment with you. 
that this might be the beginning of our week, a week that's lived out according to your plan, a moment of change and transformation where we resolve to follow you in a different way. Lord, just pour out your grace as that blessing of your presence. Lord, that today we might hear from you. So, Lord, we invite you into this house. And have it the praise of your people, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, come on, let's join together and sing this morning as we're excited to be together as a church. That's exactly what we're going to sing right now. So we worship. Oh, we worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, but my God, he holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, who we won't be quiet, and we shout out. Oh, my
when we lift it up together. In the heights of heaven, you step down to earth. You sent perfection, you gave your life for us. Yes, we stand in awe. We have been changed by the power of the cross. How great is your love, how great, how great, how great is your love, how great, how great, how great is your love for us. God himself took on flesh and walked on this earth. We highlight that. We see the sacrifice that he did on the cross. But today I want to highlight 
a different aspect, a different side of Jesus Christ, His divinity. Colossians 1 has an excellent and just amazing description of who Christ is. And that's the person who took on flesh. And that's the person who came all the way down to rescue you, to rescue me. Christ, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by Him and for Him. That's the Christ we praise. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the, the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all His fullness, all the fullness of God dwell in Him. And through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through the, His blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated for, from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now He has reconciled you by Christ's physical uh, body through the death to present you holy in His sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue to hold your faith established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. That's our Christ. Everything was created by Him and through Him. Everything is for Him. He is the image of the invisible God. God was pleased to have His fullness, the fullness of God in Him. That's the Christ we praise. And that's the almighty being who took on flesh to save you. That is just amazing. We don't deserve that. Thank you, Father. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for coming down to save us. Thank you, Christ. You are way, way beyond what our finite minds can grasp. But thank you for revealing yourself to us. We know enough about you to recognize that all we can do is worship you. And please, accept our worship. Listen to our songs, to our prayers. We live for you. We are so thankful for what you did on the cross. In the name of Jesus, amen.
We thank you that you are our living hope. You are not dead in the ground. You have resurrected, ascended, and are seated at the right hand of the Father, having accomplished the full work of God on behalf of the plan of God for the people of God. Through your grace, you have saved us. You looked ahead and saw us, and you brought us to this place. Lord, you brought us to a place where we can be transformed by the empowering work of your Spirit and by your grace. And we're thankful. We ask this morning that you would continue your work in our hearts as we turn to your Word. Transform us and help us and give us grace upon grace. We thank you, Father, for your goodness, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hate using a handheld mic. <laughs> but I've been watching um, the influencers out there and all the really cool preachers use a handheld mic. And I thought, you know, <laughs> if I want to be like a really cool preacher, then I'm going to have to get with the times. Actually, that has nothing to do with it. Our, my headset is broken. So that's the only reason. Although I did find out this week that I had inadvertently bought some really cool shoes. It's not these, don't look. Uh, it's, I, was, uh, I was hanging out with our very own whiz kid, with Brandon, and uh, I'd gotten some new shoes because I just needed some new shoes. And I looked down, and what do you, what do you think happened? We had the same shoes on. And I thought, I thought, this is either really good or really bad. Either everybody's going to look at my shoes now and they're going to say, what's, tr what's Kevin trying to be? Or they're like 95% of the men in this room didn't even know I was wearing shoes until I just mentioned it. I'm not sure which way we'll go, but anyway, I got me some cool shoes. You know, there are a lot of influencers in this world. Influencers kind of came along, that title kind of came along with the introduction of social media with its predominance in uh, the public sphere. And 
influence is nothing new, but influencers do something a little different. They're not just marketing to you. They're saying, I want you to be like me. And they're showing you all different aspects of life. So they're showing you their makeup and how they do their makeup, or they're showing you their clothes, or they're showing you their workout, or they're showing you their car, or they're showing you uh, whatever it might be. They're cooking. And they're saying, if you really want to be fill in the blank, then you'll be like me. The rise of the influencer is nothing new, but it But every influencer is an abstraction of an identity. In fact, everything you see on social media is an abstraction of an identity, and abstractions are nothing new. In fact, I want you to see a collection of pictures that um, are by Pablo Picasso. So some of you, we have just exceeded your knowledge capacity here with talks of a, uh, a famous painter. But I want you to see these sketches. Now, each of these is, according to Pablo himself, is a bull. But you can see the relative abstraction encased in each of them. Some of them, it's kind of a grotesque bull, even with some shading. And then some are just a collection of lines. And you know what? I could not draw even a single time, a single thing, not even the the most vague abstraction that looked anything like a bull. But if you look across the page here, all of these, all of these, given the right context, you could say, you know, okay, that kind of represents a bull. And everywhere we go in our world, there are identity abstractions. They're not so dissimilar from what Picasso laid out with the bull. They have certain features, but they don't have other features. And all around us in this whole world, what the world is driving at is a question of two identities. At the core of what operates the uh, Uh, The system of our brain are these competing identities. The first identity is the who am I identity. It's built on the abstractions of human identity. You want to fit in. You want to be like. You want to have certain things so that you are a certain way. You want cool shoes so you're in the cool crowd. As you get older, you realize that cool shoes aren't going to cut it. You need a cool car. And then you find out that even dorks have cool cars. Especially dorks have cool cars. Because they invested in the right things. And so you say, well, maybe I need to change my identity and become somebody else. Maybe I need to change my life. And in order to do that, I need to change my identity. And all of a sudden, you are into the who am I world. In fact, when it comes to parenting, I want you to know the competition that generally is going on in our households. Every little child is already committed to a who am I identity. It is self-worship. But they're not the only ones. You see, the big problem for our kids are not just their actions, but also their attitudes and their appetites. And you know what the big problem for adults, for those kids' parents who are supposed to have it together and supposed to have something to offer and supposed to be able to coach and guide and help their kids, you know what the big problem for their parents is? Not just actions, but also attitudes and appetites. You see, the problem for our kids and the problem for us and the problem with parenting and the problem with heritage creation, godly heritage creation, is, in fact, the who am I question. Ladies, some of you got midlife husbands and you're wondering when they're going to wake up and get serious about the things that really matter. And you're saying to yourself, and some of you have already started the elbowing. I see you. You're like, listen, he's about to deliver the KO. Get your chin up so you can receive it and be transformed, right? That's what you're saying already. You know what midlife is, ladies? Talking about your husbands now. You know what midlife is? It's the same who am I question coming, at to, coming back to visit 
at the occasions of major change in life. You know where we first ask the who am I question? It's called the terrible twos. At that phase in development, a child really begins, by the way, they're already evil before they're two, but they really begin to express their independence. They want to be themselves. And so they decide, you know what, Mom? I'm going to take you on. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen in a place where I can hurt you. You know what that is? It's the aisle of the grocery store. You, you know why they are the way they are in the grocery store? Because they know that by embarrassing you, they can leverage your sense of dignity against what they want. That's why they do this. My mom gave me this really great piece of advice. You know what it was? It was really super simple. She said, Kevin, when you're parenting your kids, you got to win. You have to win. If your kids start winning, it's really hard to take back the victories. And I tell you what, if there's ever been a more manipulative age than two years old, I don't know what it would be. They don't even know very many words at that phase. But they can read your mind and they can sense when they can deliver the KO punch to your parenting. They can perform the takedown. So you walk down the cereal aisle and you're reaching for the Cheerios and you can feel them begin to start. They don't want Cheerios. What do they want? Yeah, whatever it is, but they're going to tell you they don't want Cheerios. See, you know why? Because Cheerios are baby food. Remember? Fine motor skills learned with Cheerios. You had to chase them around. This kid had to chase them around the, the tray on the high chair, trying to pick them up. Fine motor skills learned there. But they soon learned, somebody spoiled it, probably your grandparents, spoiled them on Fruit Loops. And Fruit Loops and Cheerios look the same, but are fundamentally different. And now, and now that I'm old, I never eat Cheerios, but I sometimes eat Fruit Loops. Because I'm a man and I have my own wallet. I can buy what I want. <laughs> Take that, Mom. This is who am I question that we are competing with, and the competition, the competition is with another question, the Lord, who are you question. And this question assumes that God has given us his very own image to bear. Scripture makes it real clear that humanity of all the creatures of this earth was created to bear the image of God. That the very goodness of creation was that humanity bore the image of God. That's what makes us special. Not our capability, not who we are, but who we represent. And so the real question for life, the the big thing that has to happen is we have to begin to understand we're purpose-built people. And the little people that, that are in our life, our job with them is to help them represent the image of God. And listen, some of you are feeling like you already missed it, and we, we haven't even got out of the introduction of this message this morning. And you're like, I've already failed. Folks, the beautiful thing about flipping the scripts, and today, here's what we need to do. We need to learn how to switch our influencer. It's a question change. We need to flip this, uh, we need to switch our influencer, and it's a question change from who am I to Lord, who are you? And I want to tell you, here's the redemption for every bit of our heritage creation. And frankly, it goes as broadly as to say, it doesn't matter your political party and it doesn't matter your church affiliation. It matters, Lord, who are you? Identity is found exclusively and solely in that. Our Lord God, who has created you, purpose-built to reflect his image within this creation. The problem is the who am I question is what we grow up learning. So who am I is the world's influencer. Who am I as the world's influencer? It always gets answered by the world. If you roll out there, and you can type this in anywhere, and you can even hear it preached in churches, if you roll out there the question, 
the who am I question, the world is guaranteed to respond to you. And it will define you by your social classification, by your racial classification, and if, uh, by your economic classification. You name the classifications. You know the thing about um, schisms among people, about divisions among people, is we find a way to be divided. You could have the same complexion and the same money and the same situation, and we would find a way to divide ourselves. It happens everywhere, every time, in every culture. So we're like, hey, if we could just solve the problems of racism and classism and and all of these, then we would be at the pinnacle of human achievements. The problem is there's a bunch of individuals who start out as little babies and who are corrupted like us, and they're all asking the who am I question, and the world is more than glad to provide an answer. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to camp in verses 1 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. You know, I don't know, I, I just feel cooler holding this microphone. Th- those guys are on to something. Does it feel cooler to you? Do I feel cooler to you? I feel cooler to you. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Stand with me as we read God's word. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body uh, and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Our Lord, we ask that you give us guidance in your word today as we tackle this ever-present idolatry of self. But help us to ask the right question in Jesus' name. Amen. As I sought to kind of tackle this issue, I think at most we can give a cursory handling of both this passage and this idea. I see as fundamental in our shift in mind that we have to move beyond the who am I question because the who am I question always gets echoed back to us and the answers are always less than we hope they will be. The who am I question is tailored to your ethnicity and your age and all of the features of the flesh. But increasingly, our kids are being attacked at that level of the flesh. They're being challenged to conform their bodies to their mental image, to how they feel. And it's an example. This gender stuff and the sexual identity stuff are all aspects of the who am I question. They're all ways in which we are deifying ourselves and diminishing God, at least in our minds, diminishing God. The Who Am I heritage is uh, got a few features to it that maybe you'll recognize in either your raising or in your parenting. When we lean into the Who Am I question in regards to our kids, when we say, man, who does this kid need to be? They're really exceptional. Or maybe they're like, this kid is really sadistic. I don't know what kind of person this kid's going to be. And we began to filter through what kind of future our kids have. And come on, now all of us, 
would dream that our kids would achieve some kind of greatness, however you find you define greatness. My dad was never good at sports. I was really good at sports, and so I thought my future lay in being a professional football player. I loved soccer. I didn't so much love football, but I thought, you know, I can go far. And then as the world unfolded before me, I realized that when I was being recruited by UTEP, one thing, you don't really go from UTEP, University of Texas, El Paso, to the pros. You don't tell yourself that in the moment, but that's not the way that works. I realized eventually, like five or six years later, when, uh, when the future was no longer going to be that, I realized five or six years later that I wasn't the guy they wanted. I was the friend of the guy they wanted. They wanted me to come along and be the stabilizing force for the guy that they really wanted. So they're going to bring me on, but I was the, I was the wingman. I was never the man. You know, that, ha- that takes a punch at your ego a little bit. And yet throughout my life, the, the, the things I saw portrayed in front of me were who am I questions. Where there was a searching, a desire to find and discover and self-actualize and become important or do important things. And all of us want to be important and we want to do important things. And we're influenced by our world that says, listen, if they don't know your name, if you don't get the likes on your social media, then you're not that important. Kids, you are pushed that line of goods. And so here's some examples of the Who Am I heritage as it affects our daily parenting. With Who Am I, what you're trying to do as a parent is control rather than steward. You know what control is? You ever had a remote control car and you drive it around? You're in absolute control until the battery dies. That's the only time you're out of control. Nothing else tells that car where to go. And it would be nice if they gave two-year-olds or if they invented, so there's some technology out there that's like brain implants. I'm thinking two-year-olds should come equipped with those so you could always go to manual override when the kid's out of order, right? You can switch it on, you can pick up the controller, and you're like, no, you're going to stay with me. Control is a part of the who am I question because we don't want our kids. We can't trust our kids to do the right things, so we want to control them to the right things. We want them to have the right grades, and we want them to have the right friends, and we want them to have the right ideas, and so we want to control. The problem is there's only so long you can hold the rope for your kids, and eventually they get too heavy, and you can't hold them anymore. Who am I? Parenting is control parenting. And instead it should be stewardship. See, control parenting says, listen, this kid represents who I am, and so I need to make sure he represents well. Stewardship parenting said, this kid belongs to God, and I need to put his compass pointed toward the one in whose image he's supposed to be developing into. I don't want to create another version of me, Lord help us, I want to create an opportunity for my child to hear from God with the fewest numbers of obstacles in his way. Who am I heritage is selfish rather than selfless. Here's an impulse, ladies. I think um, this happens to you often. Guys, it happens to us as well, but We just don't chalk the same kind of hours. Your kid knows that he can or she can embarrass you. Don't worry. Eventually, the script, as they get older, will flip. And your kid will know that you can embarrass them. And when they're worried about you embarrassing them, you just remind them that there was a a day when the shoe was on the other foot. And so your kid decides that they're going to throw an absolute meltdown fit in front of all of these other moms and these other kids. And you know what they're doing? Listen, don't think this is random. They know what they're doing. You're like, that 18-year-old, 18-month-old, 18-year-old too, 18-month-old can't know. They're not that wise. Look, kids are ignorant, but they're not dumb. They get it, 
and they're throwing that fit, and you know what they want? They want to control you. They want to use embarrassment in order to get you to obey them. And they're going to use this on you. And so you know what you do to the screaming child that's thrown himself on the ground? There's a temptation to say, they're making me look bad. All these moms in here are looking at us, child. You need to get up on your feet. And that kid's like, yes, I know it. That's exactly why I'm on the ground. Because I know they're all looking at you, and I'm leveraging it. So, moms, let me, let me just give you a hint. Step over, not on, over the child. And move on. If you embarrassed parent, it's actually a selfish thing. It is for your sake. In order, in order to, it's counterintuitive to us. In order to leverage the Lord, who are you? Focus. We are denying ourselves in those moments, even when our kids make us look bad. Folks, embarrassment parenting never goes away once it gets a root in your life because your kids are going to do some dumb stuff. It's just the reality of it. Some of you young guys, you're contemplating doing some dumb stuff. Some of you are contemplating doing things that aren't dumb but that are your way. You want to pursue a path, and your parents are like, no, you know, there's no money in that career. You really need to do something else. And parents, some of us with older kids, what we're thinking of, what we're thinking in our minds is they're going to waste everything I put into them. And they're going to embarrass us. They're just going to live at home in the basement if they don't get off their rear end and go on and do something important in this life. Listen, who am I parenting is fundamentally selfish. I know you want the best for your kids, but listen, your flesh is also involved and selfishness creeps in to the parenting heritage task. Grandparents, listen, some of your kids are talking about homeschooling. And here's what you're saying. You know, I've met some homeschool kids before. And I don't love that result. Are you sure? Are you really sure you want to do that? And you know what you're worried about? Moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles, brothers and sisters. You're worried about those kids embarrassing you. It's selfishness. Who am I? Heritage is chasing them rather than them following you. Chasing them rather than them following you. This is a really tough one. I want you to see the condition of the soul, chapter 2, verse 1, in Ephesians. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. you catch what he says? Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. What he's saying is, listen, when we were broken before salvation, we were just going along with it. We were in the current, and we were helpless to stop the floating downstream. And if you don't treat your kids that as if they need to follow you, then they will head toward destruction, folks. If as a church, what we say is, listen, we want to chase after these students so we can get them in. We want to cater and we want to say and we want to capitulate to the big uh, uh, issues that are on their mind. You know what one of the leading causes of deconstruction is said to be? It's said to be the church's position on LGBTQ plus alphabet soup issues and that young people just cannot stand for our Biblical take on manhood and womanhood and on marriage and on gender. And so they're leaving the faith. The Bible and the author of the Bible, the Lord himself, expects us to follow him. And he does not chase us. Submission to him is the biblical way. Not capitulation to us. So at the end of the day, we can say a lot of things, but they've got to be textual, scriptural things. And we help our kids by holding the line on truth. Let me tell you something that's coming along. The line and has already hit most of our homes. 
as our kids are coming out with the alt lifestyle, as we used to call it. And they're putting parents in a spot where they feel like they're going to lose relationship with their kid if they don't conform to the beliefs of their kid. Now, i, I got to tell you, uh, we've been, as churches, we've tended to punch rather than to listen. We don't need to punch. That's the wrong instinct. But at the same time, folks, the... The obligation of everybody who follows Jesus is to actually follow Jesus. Notice, it's not Jesus following you, it's you following Christ. And kids learn a vibrant faith of following Christ by first learning to follow their parents. The Who Am I heritage is concerned about moral contentment rather than life transformation. So as long as we look good and act good, we are good. And the scripture tells us in this passage, in this death blow to our identity, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. I've seen a lot of made-up corpses, but they're still dead. They look great in the box, but they're still dead in the box. And folks, this is exactly what the apostle represents in this passage, this idea that the looks, moral contentment is not enough. We are looking for for life transformation. Some of us, we're heritage parenting through achievement rather than mission. They win, I'm good. They lose, I'm bad. Kind of feeling. And so we want them to achieve and achieve and achieve. And how will they ever be the person they need to be if they don't achieve? It's because the reality of it, the person they need to be is God-defined, not parent-defined. I want to show you a little chart right quick. I believe social media as a construct is a result of the who am I question. And I believe it has devastating effect. Now, I I put two things together. Here is up through 2020. And here's a chart of major depressive episodes in the past several years by age. And I want you to see on the right-hand side there the... uh, the founding of different social media platforms. <laughs> I, I didn't know LinkedIn was first, but anyway. Um, you have Facebook in 04 and YouTube in 05 and Twitter in 06. Those are your biggies in the early days. Some of you young people have never known anything but Instagram, but the grandparent or the parents of Instagram were, were these other ones. And then you've got some others in here, like you've got Snapchat and you've got different things, right? All kinds of social platforms are there now. But these are the biggies. And if you do the calculation, you see how the younger two groups, the blue and the black group there, how they have skyrocketing instances of major depressive issues starting in about 2012. If you calculate from 2004, when social media begins to hit the market, into 2012, you start realizing that there's some correlation. Now, I'm not going to go as far as to call this causation, but there's correlation between the rise of social media platforms and the rise of major depressive disorders and subsequent medicating that has occurred. The who am I question, folks? Listen, beyond this chart and these correlations, the who am I question always echoes back deficiency. If the influence in your life is who am I, then you're going to find all the reasons in this life why you do not measure up. And you will find yourself in this devastating effect where you're neither pleasing God nor pleasing to yourself. Because to whom will you measure yourself? There's always a new winner. There's always a, a prettier girl. There's always... Right? Something else out there. The question, so we look back at our text. I want you to see what Christ has done. Verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, Christ made us alive together with Christ, with himself. By grace you have been saved. So, meaning, not your works, but the work of God made you alive in the first place. And then there's this progression. And he raised us up with him. 
There's the stewardship of Christ, the rearing of godly heritage. He raised us up with him. He seated and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. All right, let me ask you, what fame or fortune is better than a seat next to Jesus? What lifestyle choices, what who am I answer would be better than I'm setting with Christ in the heavenly places? You see, this is his point. You went from a corpse looking good in the coffin to being alive in the spirit with Christ and not just alive at a distance, but alive in the spirit and close to him. And he did this for a purpose, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Jesus is pouring out his kindness on us. And he says this is a product of his grace, not a product of our earning. So God wasn't waiting for us to get it together, answer the who am I question, become important people before he drew us to himself. He just did the work. He made it happen. He pulled us in and he said, you matter to me. Let me tell you something. When you matter to Christ, you don't have to answer the who am I question. Men and ladies, adults, I want to tell you something. We exemplify to our children the who am I question. That is the problem. It is the self-idolatry. Not just the things we do, but the way we think about our lives and our place in this world. Notice what he says in verse 10. For we are whose workmanship? His workmanship. You know, I'm really grateful for my parents. But it is Christ that is making me and that has been superintending my path and stewarding me along this journey. And parents, if you've got a wayward child, a prodigal, a child that's not a believer, and you're like, "Uh, they're never going to believe. I want to tell you something. If Christ can make the dead alive, then Christ can do all things. Your best parenting strategy is submission to Jesus personally, spiritual transformation, following Christ personally, and prayer to a God who raises the dead. Listen, what else do you want? I mean, we could read a really short book on faithful parenting, and I'm pretty sure those would be the big three things. Because it's just a walk with Jesus that matters the most. I want you to see this in the scripture Moses in Exodus 3 is told to go to Pharaoh and say, let my, not Moses' people, but God's people, let my people go. Moses was sent by God to the world power of the day and said, just to flatly tell him that God says, the God of Israel, Yahweh himself says, let my people go. And Moses says, he asked this question, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And that who am I question, the, the verbal sound of God's name, Yahweh, sounds like I am That who am I and I am is played with in the text throughout chapter 3 and chapter 4. There's a competition of identities. The idea of who's going to get this done. Is it going to be Moses or is it going to be God? And so Moses goes through, goes to Pharaoh. There's the ten plagues. There's the Passover. There's the parting of the Red Sea. There's the walking through on dry ground. There's the waters of Meribah that were sour and made sweet. There's all these things that God does. There's a, 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 a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. And throughout, God superintends. And he's like right there with Israel. And chapter 3 comes around. And chapter, th- or, excuse me, chapter 3 leads to chapter 33. Chapter 33, 18 is the pinnacle of the story. 
Moses started by saying, who am I that I should do this? I don't know who you are, God, but I know who I am. I'm not big enough. I'm not strong enough. And God, God never answers the question. He just says, but I will be with you. So the question is not who you are. The question is who is God. So he gets to the mountain and he sees God, chapter 33, 18. He sees the backside of God. And as he's talking to God, he says, see, you have told me to do all these things and be all these things and all of this, but here's the one thing that I want, Moses, that I want. Show me your glory. You see, Moses, at the end of this epic journey with God where God's miracles are everywhere, finally gets to the brass tacks of it, and he realizes what God has been doing. The question was never, who am I? It was always, Lord, who are you? And he finally asks that question. Now, Moses had spoken with God many times. I mean, his first conversation was before a a burning bush that didn't burn up. We need some of those kind of bushes in Texas, don't we? It seems like everything is ready to catch on fire if you blink too hard. But Moses, after seeing God work, then asks God who he is, like, Show me the essence of your person. I, don't, I, I mean, yeah, there's all the big things you did, but like, I want to get this personally. And it's after that that Moses' face glows. It's interesting. He sees all the miracles, but his face doesn't glow. But he finally asks the right question, and then his whole physical self is transformed. Christ Jesus, who are you, is the Christ follower's heritage. That's what we're about. I want to give you a few important things because I think this matters for us to talk about and orient to. Our physical identity is part of God's creation. We steward this identity, this physical identity. So I don't want you to hear me say that the physical identity doesn't matter. It matters very much to God. And that's why this, this questioning phase in our culture's degeneration is so destructive to our young people. And so young people, I hope you'll listen as we walk through this right quick. And parents, I hope you'll listen as you uh, work through the potential questions that you're getting. Masculinity is a creation of God. And femininity is a creation of God. Toxic masculinity is an invention of people, is flesh-focused. The radical feminization or or feminism or the, uh, you know, what is a woman's stuff that's out there is an invention of people. But God knows and was specific in the creation of men and women as masculine and feminine. We ought not caricature these identities. So it's not about dresses or pants. I mean, there's some, William Wallace was a Scotsman, and he wore a kilt. So whatever you say, it's got to be, there is certain masculine features of our culture. And so when we're dealing with our kids in really practical ways, we ought to endorse a natural masculinity and a natural femininity. Arnold Schwarzenegger was never naturally masculine. And it's an overstatement, right? Most of us don't look like that, especially you get a little older. Everything is sinking to the belly. And here's the other important feature. You can know a lot about how you're supposed to parent your kids toward Christ just through their anatomy. Anatomy speaks gender. Okay? Hear me really clearly. Anatomy speaks gender, not feelings. Who am I? I feel, though I see my anatomy, I feel differently than that. Um, I want to be gentle with this because some people are struggling with this either because they've been deceived or because other things are going on. And realize, as parents, we're dealing with attitudes, actions, and appetites. And all three of those are and, and in different ways get corrupted by our world. So we need to understand this, that when we are talking about modesty 
when we're talking with our kids about what it means to be a man or a woman, we are doing so based on biology, not based on internal feelings, and we need to help our kids get anchored to their biology. I reject the idea of orientation. There can be corrupted sexual appetite, same-sex appetite, but that's not an inborn matter. That is a corruption because of the fall into sin. We're still, according to our biology, we are opposite sex focused in our sexual expression, but even that is qualified in the scripture. That sexual expression has one platform, and that's called marriage. So celibacy is legitimate in the Lord. There may be no sexual expression, but that neither makes you, quote, gay or homosexual or anything else. Sexuality and gender are still determined by biology. So, parents, if you're looking for some strategy in this crazy world of identities and influencers, i got to tell you, anatomy speaks volumes of some of the general structuring that you use to talk to your kids. I remember... We were raising our kids, and uh, my daughter was acting out. And I responded to her, and I start the discipline process, and we work through it. And uh, a little bit later on, Tracy calls me in. You ever been called in? I called in. She's like, Kevin, you cannot discipline her in the same manner that you discipline the boys. And she wasn't talking, we're not talking about physical discipline. She was talking about the way I confronted my daughter and the way I spoke to her in the moments of discipline. She said, it's, they're not the boys. You will crush her if you don't change the way you focus your comments. And she was dead on accurate. That biology mattered to even the emotional uptake and parents, listen, don't be afraid of that. We want to raise little girls and little boys, and, their, and we want their anatomy to equate the raising of little boys and little girls and never give up on that, no matter what the culture is saying. We are not self-defined. We are God-defined. So this brings us really to, to the head of this thing. We have to build a single altar we have to have in our homes a single altar, and it can't be the altar of self. It has to be the altar of God, worship of God. And that means that we are picking our subject of worship, either me through the who am I or you through the who are you. We're either asking God to define us or we're de facto self-defining and so it needs to be obvious in your home who the object of worship is. It doesn't need to be just a feature of your Sundays or some activities that you add on. It needs to be the subject of your very soul and your life together. We have to value what God values. You know what God values? He values fruitful lives. He values lives that are poured out on behalf of his work. He values the growth of those uh, fruits of the spirit of love, of joy, of peace, of patience, of kindness, of goodness, of faithfulness, of gentleness, and self-control. And parents, is that not what you want? You want all of that, and I tell you, it's not the fruit of good parenting that brings it. It is the fruit of the spirit of God. So if your altar is wrong, the results will be wrong. You don't grow coconuts on apple trees, I'm told. And if you want the right fruit, you have to grow the right tree so that it's a single altar in the home. You have to value what God values. And this means affirmation, affirmation, affirmation. This means you have to believe. Affirmation means that you believe in your kids, not in the self-established kind of way, but you know what? Your kids... And your spouse and you can follow Jesus. Now, whether you will or not is another question, but you can. 
the door has been opened and the grace of God is a, has been poured out and God will do that work. Listen, what you've got to do is get them to Christ and value his fruit in their life. So when your kid comes in and says, listen, you know, I know what my bio- biology says and I know you guys are going to disagree with me, but here's what I'm feeling. And they drop the bomb on you. James Dobson used to say that there are moments of horror in every parenting experience. And some of you remember when you were a kid and you brought the moment of horror on your parents. And some of you remember when your kids told you that nuclear bomb type thing and ruined their world. They thought so much about you and, and, uh, uh, and then they bring you this devastating news or something devastating happens and it changes your whole life. We had a family here, a beautiful family of four, a husband and wife, and their two girls. I had an eight-year-old and a and a uh, two-year-old, and they were coming to church, and they were hit broadside by a car, and it killed mom and the older daughter instantly. Dad was in a coma for uh, about ten weeks, and only the daughter, only the little one in our car seat, um, sur- uh, survived unharmed. And listen, folks. The who am I question is so subject to what happens in this world. I mean, one day you're a dad of two and a husband of wife, and the next day you're now a surviving dad of one, and your wife is deceased. Life changes, and the who am I question will always leave you vacant. And if you don't believe that your kids can follow Christ, then what you're going to try to do is protect them from the influences of the world, and I tell you, you cannot do it. You can drive down the road and see the billboards and get enough of the world to understand what it's made of. You cannot do it. You Parents, you need to, want to protect your kids from pornography, but I tell you, if they're in the public school, you know who else is looking at it? In the bathroom, during the class time, when they're eight years old. They're friends, and do you think they're keeping that to themselves? Absolutely not on little phones and devices and whatever else they have. They find a way, parents. And so we've got to help our kids be followers of Jesus, and you have to believe that they can, or you will be in anxiety the rest of your life. So you have to believe that God has a handle on them, and you have to affirm their faith and their walk in Jesus. And I'm going to borrow something from Paul David Tripp. He mentions being a process parent rather than a results parent. So what he means. My biggest concern cannot be that my kid behaves today. My biggest concern has to be that we make progress in this process of their development. So we didn't have a bad day today. Moms, you're going to have some bad days. Dads, you're going to have some bad days. Siblings, you're going to have some bad days. I remember those days when one of my three siblings was just not having it that day. And you know what? The problem for every other sibling, everybody suffers. Do you remember that? Your older brother's being a punk, so everybody else has pretty much got to be in time out along with him because he can't do anything, but he's got to be, uh, you know, he can't, he's not allowed to watch TV. He's grounded from something, and the, that just means everybody else can't. You're like, come on, older brother, get it together. We've got to get on with our lives. Be a process parent. It just means that you're in this and you're working through it. You're looking at the long game, and yes, you're going to step past that child in the aisle, and they might challenge you 14 times, and you're like, haven't we been over this before? Yes, you have, but this is a process. And when they learn to follow you and when they learn to submit to your authority, you are producing for them the, ref- the fruit of righteousness in the future when they learn to do that in their adult lives. And this is a little bit off the beaten path, but i got to land this plane. This is a long sermon. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Give children the adult version that is kid accessible. Here's what I mean. You can read the Old Testament, and there's a lot of stuff in there. And you may be worried about traumatizing your kids. Now, I don't suggest that you spend a lot of time talking about concubines that get cut up into pieces. You can probably skate past that pretty quickly. 
But your kids need to understand that the Bible is not cartoony characters teaching moral lessons, but is a divine, holy God working with sinful, rebellious people to bring them from death to life. They have to experience the gravity of Ephesians 2 where we're dead and yet we're made alive in Jesus. And from the earliest days, it cannot be a cartoon of morality. It has to be the fabric of your life. And so from very early, and we try to do this with our Institute for Children and our students, we want to give them tools to access the truth and have the text in front of them and refer back to the Bible. So we've got to switch the question to, Lord, who are you? We stand with me. I'm going to move us quickly to the end of our time. We are way out of time. Team, I'm going to ask you just to hold where you're at. And uh, we're going to close in a time of prayer this morning. We're not going to do our song and all that kind of stuff. We're going to close in a time of prayer. But listen, I really believe this is one of the most critical things for your life. Not just as a parent. You may be here and you're like, I'm a long way from having kids. Or I'm a long way past having kids. But listen, the who am I question is still on you. Self-idolatry is still pushing you. And the question today is whether you're willing to take the jump and switch the question and ask the right one, Lord, who are you? Lord, who are you? Show me your glory because I want to see the fullness of Christ in my life, lived out, and I'm ready, and I want to go on that walk with you? That's the question. And that is the switch that's in front of you today. So I'm going to close this in a time just of prayer. Father, I thank you for your goodness, for your blessing and your holiness and your power. And that, Lord, while we were dead, not because of our works, but because of the grace of Jesus and his work on the cross and his calling to salvation, you have made us alive. Well, there are some who have never trusted Christ. They've never been made alive, and you're calling to them right now for this moment. Lord, there are others here, parents, and uh, just kind of at their wits' end and uncertain what to do and how to move forward. And this rings for them, this idea that they've been parenting from the who are you rather than uh, from the who am I question rather than from the who are you question. And Lord, they need to make the switch and put it into practice and they don't know if they have the coordination to, to make it happen. Lord, I ask that you would give them courage to, to make that switch. Lord, there's some of us here and our life is controlled by what we perceive is our personal identity expressed before other people. And we need escape from that personal idolatry. And Lord, today we confess first that that is our sin of self-idolatry. We have desperately desired to be self-defined. And today we want to say, take us on the journey of repentance to being God-defined. We trust you and we look to you for that transformation. Lord, so will you do this work in our hearts? We trust you for it in this week and we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me give you a few announcements and then we'll dismiss this morning. Reminder uh, about marriage weekend that's coming up, so get ready for that and connected to that. And then number two, for some of our young adults, uh, meaning under 30, and uh, if, especially if you're kind of solo out there, we've got a new thing we're cranking up. It's called uh, our Cana Solo, Cana Cam Solo, and um, there's a way to connect to this. I think it's on the screen here behind me. You can scan that. We'll leave it up for a little bit. If you've got a young person and they just, like, church is, they're not sure that church is their thing and they don't at least want to start here or you're here and you're like, what is there for me? Listen, this is for you. Here it is. It's super simple. Um, each week there will be a collection of houses that are available and they're having a meal. So it's free food. And during the meal, you'll have some spiritual conversation. But listen, it's way better than Taco Bell. And it's a way for you to just be connected with other folks. And so you can have a family meal. 
these people, you get in the, this is a, a web app. I don't know how all that part works, but you just scan it, go where it takes you. You'll see places where you can just schedule to be a part of that meal. You just RSVP, you say, I'm coming, I'm bringing two friends, and, uh, and then it'll put you in contact. You can message back and forth with the host. Uh, we're giving it kind of a beta run. This is a product of our WizKid, and so he's put all this together. We don't know exactly how great it's going to function, but I think it is an opportunity for us to reach people that we haven't reached before. So if, listen, if you're 18 and older, this is for you. You can jump in on this. It's a no kids kind of thing. So you can have your kids if you're a host home, but if you're not, you can't take your kids. So you jump on this and it'll be a good time and an opportunity just to have some community and uh, connections with others. Okay, uh, let me pray for us and then we are dismissed today. Father, we love you and thank you. I ask for your blessings on your people. Do a great work uh, in us and through us, Lord. We want to know who you are. Show us your glory as a congregation and as individuals. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.